upon the one in bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity. Oh, there will be a day when all will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with you, dying a rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. And every prayer we prayed in desperation, the songs of faith we sang through doubt. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 1 says, At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a remission. This is the manner of remission. Every creditor shall release what he has loaned to his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor and his brother because, because the Lord's remission has been proclaimed. Father, we know, we understand, we can look back and we get what the Lord's remission really is all about. You have proclaimed a freedom from all the debt of sin. You have remitted, Lord, our failures, our rebellions, our foolishness, full remission. If 
by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we sing praise and honor and glory to your name. We, we show up in this place because we've got to gather to worship you. We must praise you. We can't help but to do so when we recognize the full remission granted to us by our great God and Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. So Spirit of the living God, I simply ask you to fill this room this morning with joy, the joy of your presence, the hope of our future and the love that is so obvious through Jesus our Lord. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.
stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death, and the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe, for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored, and the church of Christ. As I was driving out here this morning, I was listening to an old song I remember growing up listening to by Michael Carr. But before I get there, I want us to think about why we're able to take this this morning. We know what it represents, and I'm going to remind us all here in a moment, but why are we able to take this? Galatians 5 says that it's for freedom's sake that Jesus set us free. He, he is the captain of freedom, and he's come to set us free. And it's interesting, as we come to these tables, we're reminded that Jesus, the night of his betrayal, had a table prepared, and he took a meal with his guys, celebratory meal. And he said, this is the new covenant in my body. Take it. And then it's interesting, we go to Revelation, and what do we see? Jesus has a banquet table set for his bride to take part in with him. We celebrate who he is and what he's done. And therefore, because of who he is and what he's done, what that makes us, who, who we are, what our identity is. And here, Michael Card, I'll, I'll just read a couple verses here. Come to the table and savor the sight, the wine and the bread that was broken. And all have been welcome to come. If they might accept as their own these two tokens. The bread is his body. The wine is the blood. And the one who provides them, that's Jesus, is true. He freely offers, we freely receive. To accept and believe him is all we must do. And here at the table sit those who have loved you. One is a traitor and one will deny, but he's lived his life for them all and for all be crucified. Come to the table he's prepared for you. The bread of forgiveness, the wine of release, Come to the table and sit down beside him. The Savior wants you to join in the feast. Lord, I look forward to that day where I get to sit at this table with you as you serve us, which blows my mind that you would serve us still. And I take part with your church, Lord. I, I look forward to that day. Thank you for pardoning our sins, for making the way for being the perfect sacrifice for us. We want to take this moment now this morning, continue to worship you, and we worship you, Lord, because of what you have done, because of who you are. In your name, Jesus, we pray and we praise you. Amen. Let's come to the tables.
Lord Jesus, we do thank you for your grace and your mercy and your sacrifice. We glory in your resurrection and worship your most holy name. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Good morning. Got a few quick announcements for you. Uh, home groups will be starting back up. If you're interested, contact Jake, who we also refer to as Yakov or Dude. <laughs> These ministry info cards, I remind you, are in the back. They're on the back counter there. And if you have a desire to get involved in ministry of some kind, you can check a box and it will be sent to the appropriate person and they'll get a hold of you. But we have those out for you as well. Speaking of ministries, if you are interested in serving or being a part of the security team, um, we can, how does it say, talk to Dean, right? Right? Talk to Dean. Da, 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 da. Again, connection card in the back. So we need some help in security. We need all kinds of help. You all know that. This Wednesday night, Pastor Sharam Hadian is going to be speaking to us. He's going to be here in town. If you have not heard Pastor Hadian, um, he's an excellent speaker, really interesting stuff. I've mentioned this now the last couple of weeks. Born in Iran, born a Muslim, born and raised, and gave his life to Christ, and has quite a testimony, and he has a thing called Truth and Love Ministry, where he goes all around and speaks and teaches, and we are going to be blessed to have him here on Wednesday. So put that on your calendar, September 1st. Can you believe it? September 1st. Wow. Also, on September 6th is Yom Teruah, so next a week from Monday, here in the sanctuary, we'll have Yom Teruah. The kids will all get their own personal, authentic <laughs> shofar. <laughs> so uh, bring the kids for those. We'll have those to pass out. And that'll be just a, a night of fellowship and joy and, and a good time. Uh, Yom Teruah, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Trumpets, on September 6th. Uh, you all are aware of the mask mandates. I don't need to think I need to say anything about that. You're aware of it. Act accordingly to your conscience. And uh, I'm leaving town, so whatever y'all do, it's good. <laughs> Cheryl and I head out on, the, uh, on Wednesday. We actually head down to the airport. We have some pre-travel uh, pre COVID testing that we're supposed to do before we can get on an airplane, and then we fly out early Thursday morning. So we'll be back. In the meantime... Y'all will be good. We'll miss you. Um, one last thing. I want to pray for Grace. Shook. Grace Shook, actually. Grace is heading back to school, and this is her last Sunday with us. So let's just take a moment and bless her before she goes. Father, we thank you for our sister. Thank you for her voice on the worship team, but more so thank, thank you for her heart in our family. Uh, she is a, a precious friend and sister and daughter. And I pray that your blessing would go with her, that you will fill her up with the truth as she goes back to school. Uh, keep her safe, Father, in your loving care. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you have 33 seconds to say hi to somebody, and then we're going to worship one more song. So say hi, not just me. <laughs>
Sing that chorus again. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Yes, Lord, all our lives. Amen and amen. You are the faithful God, true to your word, magnifying your word above all your name. Lord, you don't speak in it without it coming to be. And so we rest in that. We find peace in that and, and, and hope, Lord, in the foundation of the truth you have spoken across all history. Lord, help us to trust you more. I, I've said, and I know recently, Lord, that we here at the end of the age have more reason to trust you than any time in history because we've got all of this evidence, all of this proof, all, all of your faithfulness spoken and done that we can now this morning, Lord, say with assurance we serve a faithful God. Faithful is he who called us and faithfully he will bring it to pass. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So Deuteronomy chapter 15. And we'll take a brief pause for roughly the month of September. It's funny, I, uh, in conversations with my wife, I, I told her, I really can't wait to go get Christopher and go see Christopher. But I don't want to go to Ghana. I just do not want to travel. I am happy at home. I wonder if it was ever like that for Jesus. Oh, Lord, I can't wait to get down there and be with our people. But I don't want to go to Earth. <laughs> That's a very human-centered perspective. Uh, we know otherwise with Jesus. Hey, Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 1, at the end of every seven years, you shall grant a remission. This is the manner of remission. Every creditor shall release what he has loaned to his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor and his brother because the Lord's remission has been proclaimed. From a foreigner, you may exact it, but your hand shall release whatever of yours is with your brother. However, there will be no poor among you, since the Lord will surely bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess. If only you listen obediently to the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all this commandment which I am commanding you today. For the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised you, and you will lend to many nations, and you will not borrow. You will rule over many nations, but they will not rule over you. If there is a poor man with you, one of your brothers, in any of your towns, in your land, which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart nor close your hand from your poor brother, but you shall freely open your hand to him and shall generously lend him sufficient for his need in whatever he lacks. Beware that there is no base thought in your heart saying, the seventh year, the year of remission is near and your eye is hostile toward your poor brother and you give him nothing then he may cry to the Lord against you, and it will be a sin in you. You shall generously give to him, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him, because this thing the Lord your God will bless in you, in all your work and in all your undertakings. For the poor will never cease to be in the land. Therefore I command you, saying, you shall freely open your hand to your brother, to your needy and poor in your land. If your kinsman, a Hebrew man or woman, is sold to you, then he shall serve you six years, but in the seventh year, you shall set him free. And when you set him free, you shall not send him away empty-handed. You shall furnish him liberally from your flock 
and from your threshing floor and from your wine vat. You shall give to him as the Lord your God has blessed you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this today. For it shall come about if he says to you, I will not go out from you because he loves you and your household since he fares well with you. Then you shall take an awl and pierce it through his ear into the door and, you, and he shall be your servant forever. Also, you shall do likewise to your maidservant. It shall not seem hard to you when you set him free for he has given you six years with double the service of a hired man. So the Lord your God will bless you in whatever you do. And we ask Lord that you will simply bless the teaching and comprehension and revelation of your word this morning. That you would give us ears to hear without distraction, Lord, what you have to say, what the Spirit is saying to this fellowship in the church today. We thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness of your word and for being our faithful God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Going to Ghana. So while we're in country... Uh, I'm hoping to make some visits. Cheryl and I are trying to plan some things. And in the waiting process, we've got to get court. Uh, we have to then have a birth certificate and get a passport and get a visa. And we have to try and do all this within the time we're there. But there will be some down days. We want to do some visiting. Uh, we want to go up and visit Agape Refuge. Uh, Michael Adelot's work up in the north. We're hoping to see that, perhaps talk to the chief that's related to that. We want to go visit Mama Lottie's children's home which is special to our own hearts. We, we want to see some of these people and some of the ones that we're supporting as a church fellowship. Personally, I would like to visit Cape Coast Castle and Elmina Castle. Cape Coast and Elmina Castles. They're not sites of royal architecture. They were forts at the hub of the European slave trade. This is the spot in and out where the largest amount. In fact, let me just read this to you. This is from tracingcenter.org, which says Ghana on, West Af on Africa's west coast was the center of the British slave trade. Western traders arrived in ships loaded with manufactured goods to barter or trade for slaves. Those who were sold had often been captured in tribal warfare. Some had simply been kidnapped to sell to European slave traders. Slavery existed in Africa prior to the transatlantic trade, and in fact, the earlier trans-Saharan slave trade sent more enslaved Africans east to the Muslim world over many centuries than would be transported west to the Americas. However, the large-scale organization of European slave trading and the development of industry and massive plantations dependent on slave labor gave rise to a trade in humans that was staggering in its scale. So while more slaves were traded toward Muslim countries, the amount in a short period of time was far greater going into the European countries in America. Approximately 10 million enslaved people were transported in this transatlantic slave trade at rates of up to 100,000 persons a year. The remnants of that trade in Ghana are still visible today in dozens of forts and castles built by Europeans between 1482 and 1786. American traders did business at trading posts run by the British, the French, the Dutch, the Germans, the Spanish, Portuguese, and others, including Cape Coast Castle and Elmina Castle. And those two stand as monuments in Ghana today of the travesty and the tragedy of slavery back then. Now, I begin with that just to share with you all and, and to help us to realize humanity's complicity in the enslavement of other human beings is historical. It is long-term. Even within the African continent, there were Africans selling Africans into slavery. This is not a, a, an America problem. It's not just a one-time British or European problem. It's not even a simply a one-time Muslim nation's problem. This is a humanity problem. And while it's been cleaned up, it still takes place. There is still human trafficking. One of the reasons why it's taken us so long, over three years now, to get through this process in adopting Christopher is the Hague Agreement for Adoption, which tries to tighten down on human trafficking and, and, and slavery of children. Bureaucracy is always such a helpful thing. 
But we have been, humanity has been complicit in slavery. Only one in all history stands alone as having provided for total human freedom. Now, now think about that. We know that. We understand that. That's Jesus. He's the only one who came with the remedy to all slavery. Jesus said in Mark 10, 42, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. For whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. God allowed slavery, but did not approve slavery. He has never approved slavery. What he has done through the ransom of Jesus Christ is teach us that slavery is not in or from the heart of God. This is purely a human problem. Freedom. Is from the heart of God. As Jake read Galatians 5.1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not again be subject to a yoke of slavery. Galatians 5.13, you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the part of the law now that that Moses is approaching in his sermon, in this sermon we call Deuteronomy on the plains of Moab. Deuteronomy 15 and 16, Moses is practically preaching the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment is his focus as he's applying it to life in the promised land. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And so we talked about on Wednesday night chapters 14, 15, and 16, all this focus on rest and Shabbat and even the feasts of Israel in chapter 16 that are all about rest and celebration. But Moses is also now pulling in another command. He's leaning forward into the latter half now of the commandments, as we'll see in a moment, from the horizontal commandments. See, the vertical commandments. You shall love the Lord your God. Have no other God before him. Worship the Lord your God. Do not take his name in vain. Even remembering the Sabbath is all about relationship with God and time spent with the Lord and focus on him. But you get into the latter half of the commandments and it's horizontal. It's social, if you you will. It's the love your neighbor as yourself section of the commands. And what we're going to hear this morning is Moses pulling off of one of these, commandment number eight, you shall not steal. You shall not steal. Now, now theft takes all kinds of forms, but there's a very specific one here. You might say, what does stealing have to do with Sabbath? How are these two connected? Very simply, the theft of a human life denies the freedom of rest. The theft of a human life denies the freedom of rest. It's liberty stolen. You could almost say stealing is Thieving Shabbat, removing rest from a person, and it can come by human trafficking, or, as is the case in Deuteronomy 15, it can come by financial insolvency, specifically leading to indentured servitude, the slavery of debt. At the end of every year, verse 1, every seven years, you shall grant a remission. The end of every seven years, grant a remission. Three things to note this morning. Number one, remission. Remission. You've heard the word recently. We talked about this back in January. The word is Shemitah. Shemitah. You shall grant a Shemitah, which is forgiveness or cancellation of all debt. And every seventh year on the Jewish calendar in Israel, all debt was released. Wouldn't that be great? I'm I'm sending this in to Citibank. I think they need to read this. Process the idea. The Shemitah. Every seventh year, Shemitah. And it was a remission of debt. It was a freedom from slavery. It was a rest for the land. Every seventh year was vacation 
a year-long vacation. What a brilliant, marvelous, wonderful, restful idea, the Shemitah. Now, this word has become a fascination in the past five years or so. Some of you are familiar with the uh, author, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn. He's a Christian, messianic, refers to himself as rabbi, author of the Harbinger books, a couple of Harbinger books out there, fascinating, caught everybody's attention. He also wrote the book, The Mystery of the Shemitah, among others. By the way, just so you know, the next Shemitah in Israel on the calendar by rabbinical reckoning is a week from Monday, Yom Teruah. So this year starts the Shemitah year for Israel. This is the, supposed to be the year of rest. I'm not putting any expectations on that, but it's interesting that on the day of trumpets, September 6th, Shemitah begins. And we should be alerted to these things. Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, um, I, I hear this word Shemitah. I think about, in fact, when I realized that the Shemitah begins September 6th, and Yom Teruah, you know, Rosh Hashanah on the, on the civic calendar for Jews, but Yom Teruah, day of, day of trumpets, same day, all that, I got an electric jolt up my spine, I can just tell you. It's like, wow, that's kind of exciting. I wonder. Kahn contends that the Shemitah, if unheeded by a nation is a prophetic warning. In fact, he declares in the mystery of the Shemitah and some of his other works that this Shemitah, this is a prophetic warning against the United States of America. He's, he's ringing the warning bell. This is a portent of disastrous upheaval and unrest. Now, I think we're way ahead of the curve on upheaval and unrest in this country right now. And no question, no question that a nation's denial of God has real consequence with it. But understand the Shemitah is part of the covenant requirements of God placed on a particular specific ethnic people, the nation of Israel. This is first and foremost an Israel covenant, part of the Mosaic covenant, the conditional covenant between God and Israel. Now, we can learn from it. We can learn by Torah. We can apply it. We can see Jesus in it. We can know God through it. And we even mature, hopefully, spiritually through the study of Torah law. But this is a command with consequence for the Jewish people. So, so you need to keep that in mind. Because sometimes we can, we can take things on ourselves that were not meant for us, that were meant for others. Again, we can see pictures and types and learn from it. And my purpose this morning is not to critique Jonathan Kahn and, and his beliefs, his position on the Shemitah. But here's my position. If Bible prophecy should teach us anything, it should reveal the heart of God to us in Jesus Christ. Prophecy is about Jesus. It is always about Jesus. It's always been about Jesus, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, Revelation 19, verse 10. And so the Shemitah is yet another portrayal of God's determined desire for debt release, for remission, for freedom. That's what this, this requirement speaks of. In verse 2, this is the manner of Shemitah. Every creditor shall release what he has loaned to his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor and his brother because the Lord's Shemitah has been proclaimed. Whose Shemitah? God's. And this is not a proclamation of danger. It is a proclamation of peace and rest, a declaration of the heart of the Lord to proclaim remission for people. From a foreigner you may exact it, but your hand shall release whatever is yours with your Brother, that's interesting to me because think about this. God wants remission for everyone, and yet here he says, you can exact debt from a foreigner. How does that apply? Think about outside the family of God, debts will be required. Debts must be paid outside of the family of God. But once you enter into the family of God, all debt is remitted. All debts released when you become a child of God. Through faith in Jesus Christ, there is no more debt. It's gone. 
He says, however, there will be no poor among you, since the Lord will surely bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, if only you listen obediently to the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all this commandment which I am commanding you today. That is a commandment to the people of Israel, to the nation of Israel. Every seventh year, Shemitah, grant remission to everybody in the land. Can you even imagine what that would have done? Now, American consumer debt in 2021 stands at $4.2 trillion. That's if we add up what everybody in this country owes. We're not talking about the national debt, personal debt, consumer debt. Credit card debt alone in our country is $974.4 billion owed. God decreed in Israel every seventh year, all debts canceled, all debts remitted. This is where we're going. This is the idea, total freedom in forgiveness, total remission of all we owe. Have you ever tried to think back and go back and say, there's something back there I did, I can't remember what it was, but I wish I could so I could make it right. You can't. For every one thing you might try to fix or, or pay off on your own, there are a dozen other things you will never remember that are sin and that our debt unpaid, but by the blood of Jesus. Now, if Shemitah sounds at all familiar, we did talk about it back in January. It was the last of a series of prophecy updates that we went through at that time. The, the teaching was called the three R's, rest, release, and remission. Remission being the Shemitah. And at that time I mentioned to you, so I remind you now, Shemitah, which means remittance, remission, forgiveness, it also means to let it fall. Just let it fall, let it drop, let it go. Everything owed is now canceled, not put on hold like the current student loan pause, but gone, not waiting out there to catch up to you. This is the Lord's remission, which ultimately prophetically points to Jesus who cancels every debt of sin. Luke 24, 46, thus it is written, he said on that road to Emmaus with the two man, men on that afternoon of resurrection, thus it is written, Jesus said, that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day and that repentance for forgiveness, remission of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning with Jerusalem. And it's not just a write-off. It's not just a profit loss. It's not like what Kramer understood write-offs to be. Those of you Seinfeld fans, I'm, I'm still holding on to this show. It's going away. People don't know. This culture doesn't get what I'm talking about now. But hey, most of you still remember Kramer standing in Jerry's apartment saying, Jerry, all these big companies, they write off everything. And Jerry says, you don't even know what a write-off is. Kramer says, do you? And Jerry says, no, I don't. And Kramer says, but they do. And they're the ones writing it off. <laughs> Jerry stands there for a moment and says, wish I had the last 20 seconds of my life back. <laughs> Salvation isn't a write-off. Do you realize that? It's not God saying, well, we'll just let the sin go. No, the cancellation of our debt was paid in full paid up in full to every, every last drop of blood on the cross, where on the cross Jesus spoke the equivalent word in the, what's translated into the Greek in the New Testament, the equivalent word to the Hebrew Shemitah, and that is the word aphes. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, aphes, let it drop. They don't know what they're doing. Let it fall. How else could a person realize Sabbath rest but by the total free remission of all sin and all debt? For Israel, it followed, it followed that the Shemitah was also designed to work at a national level. So it wasn't just personal. Look at verse 6. The Lord your God will bless you as he promised you, and you will lend to many nations, but you will not borrow. And you will rule over many nations, but they will not rule over you. You're not going to have to borrow. You're not going to have any national debt. If you obey the Shemitah, I'll bless you. You don't have to borrow from other nations. 
Oh, you can lend to them. They will be indebted to you. Kind of like how we are indebted to Israel as Messiah has come. You will not be under, you will not be ruled by any nations. Just keep my Sabbath years, every seventh year. And what they do? They got into the land and for 490 years skipped the Shemitah. They didn't keep it once. So what happened? Babylon came in and ruled over them, deporting them in 586 B.C. They were there 70 years making up for every last Shemitah that they had skipped or that they had refused. Sabbath's a big deal with God. Rest is a big deal with God. Now, if you take it too far, some Christians will say, then we need to keep it every week. We need to have a Sabbath day where we do nothing, where we completely rest. Keep the Sabbath or you could lose your salvation, they say. And to them I ask, well, first of all, did you know that Sabbath is the only one of the Ten Commandments not restated in the New Testament? That's the only one. All the other nine are very specifically restated as commands for followers of Jesus Christ, not Shabbat. Why not? Because Jesus is our rest. Because he is our Shabbat. He is Lord of the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so the requirement to rest has become the freedom of rest in Jesus Christ. But there are some that are still adamant. They still say, hey, no, no, you've got to keep the Sabbath. And I say, great, if you keep the Sabbath every week, do you keep the Shemitah too? Do you take every seventh year off? Because if you don't, you're missing something. You want to keep the Sabbath? You have to keep the Shemitah. Every seventh day of the week you take off, every seventh year take the year off. Do not work. And then tell me if you believe that the church is supposed to keep the Sabbath. Jesus, he's Lord of Shabbat, but again, he is our peace. He's the one who said, I will give you rest. He said, you shall find rest for your souls in me. So having paid the full price for the remission of our sins with his blood, we come into rest, we enter his rest. And when we get that, it forms in us, number two, compassion. Compassion, remission forms compassion. Look at verse 7. If there's a poor man with you, one of your brothers, in any one of your towns, in your land, which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart, nor close your hand from your poor brother. You shall freely open your hand to him and shall generously lend him sufficient for his need in whatever he lacks. Beware that there is no base thought in your heart saying the seventh year, the year of remission is near. And your eye is hostile toward your poor brother, and you give him nothing that he may cry to the Lord against you, and it will be a sin to you. I think they could probably have, could have graphed it. You know, the generosity toward the poor in Israel probably was far greater in the first year than it was in the sixth. Because by the sixth year, my brother needs financial help, but if I give it to him now, one year from now, he will not have to pay me back. So I'm not going to, I'll wait until the start of the new seven-year cycle, and then we'll talk. Come back and see me then. God said, no, that's not the attitude to have. It doesn't matter when someone is in need. You meet the need, and you meet it generously. You shall, verse 10, generously give to him, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him, because this thing, the Lord your God, will bless you in all your work and in all your undertakings. For the poor you will, will, will never cease to be in the land. Therefore, I command you, saying, you shall freely open your hand to your brother, to the needy, and pour in your land. Wait a minute. Back in verse 4, he said, there will be no poor in your land. But now, he says, the poor will never cease to be in your land. Well, come on, Moses, which one is it? One is the ideal. The other is the reality on the ground. That the Shemitah offered the people a pathway to the eradication of, pro of poverty among God's people if they would keep it. A fresh start, a new opportunity for anyone regardless of station. And there have been occasional bright spots in this where we can see verse 4 being worked out. 
There will be no poor among you. Remember this, Acts chapter 4, verse 34? There was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them, bringing the proceeds of the sales. Why would they do that? Because they were living imminently, for one thing. That is, in the first century, they were living with the day-by-day -day expectant return of Jesus. What do I need a second house for? What do I need that for? What do I need that land for? I'm not going to be here. Sell it off. Give it to the church. And in so doing, there was no one poor among them. It was the right heart, the generous heart, the looking for Jesus heart among them, the compassionate heart. Jesus would apply this reality of poverty that the poor will never cease to be in the land. And truly, that's the case. In fact, in all history, the poor have never ceased to be among us, and some of us have been there. This, this reality is historic and was throughout the time in Israel because Israel never kept the Shemitah. Therefore, the poor was always with them and continue to be to this day. And Jesus took this reality at an inter, intimate dinner, dinner party six days before the last Passover. He, he shows up at the house of of Lazarus in Bethany having dinner. Lazarus was looking good for someone recently dead. <laughs> and they're reclining at table and he's there and the sisters are there and the friends are there and, and there's a, a, I just get a sense of, of this gathering and Jesus wanting to just be with his friends one week before he knew what was coming. Mary comes in and she breaks open this incredibly expensive perfume we think probably her dowry because it was so expensive breaks it open and begins to anoint Jesus and the apostles were incensed I always have to use that one perfume incensed <laughs> see Judas especially was upset Mark chapter 4 verse 4 says some were indignantly remarking to one another why has this perfume been wasted this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii, $840, today's money. Any of you have an $840 bottle of perfume at home? Careful not to break it. For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii, the money given to the poor. And they were scolding her, getting all up in Mary's face. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you, he quotes. And then he adds this. And whenever you wish, you can do good to them. But you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She anointed my body beforehand for the burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. Every time we read that, we just fulfilled that prophecy. We just spoke of Mary in memory of what she did to Jesus, just as Jesus said we would, here we are doing it. But he also said this, in applying the poor you will always have with you, he says two things, note this, he says, whenever you wish you can do good to them. Hey, that door's always open. The door to liberality and generosity and caring one for another is always wide open. That happens when my sense of remission fuels my compassion. When I have been set free from my debt, I want to set others free of theirs. Remission fuels compassion. But Jesus also said this. He said, and you do not always have me. Guess what? Now we do. Now we do. Right here and now. We have Jesus. We have his spirit. We have his presence. We have the mind of Christ. And so my response to the poor in this world is to be controlled by Christ's love within me. Because I move and I think and I have the person of Jesus and the mind of Christ on me. I understand the remission of my sin from him. Therefore, it breeds, it, it develops, it fuels compassion within me. Because yes, the poor we always have with us and whenever I want, I can do good to them. That's not a someday, maybe if you get around to it. That's right now, you can It's beautiful. We can do what we can. He says, Mary has done what she could. Mary has done her part. What's yours? See, I like that. He says, she's done what she could. 
Mary's whole role in the drama of the last week of the life of Jesus was to anoint him for his death. That was it. She's done what she could. She did her part. What's yours? What is mine? Don't get all hung up on what is big and impressive and visual in this world. What mighty thing can I do for God? Maybe it's simply breaking a vial of perfume and anointing. Maybe it's as simple as just caring for a brother or sister's need. Maybe that's your part. Don't let it pass by. We care for the body of Christ because when our compassion for others is enriched by our own personal debt release, poverty should cease. There is a way to end poverty in the world. It's compassion. It's our own compassion. Someone will say, well, then why do people struggle financially in the church, you hypocritical Christian pastor? <laughs> oh, yeah, poverty should cease. And why are people impoverished? And why even within the church do people struggle financially? I want you to notice, as I just read through that, that last section, all the yous and yours in Moses' personal application. Everyone is second person singular. That is, you do it. Pastor, how can we have so many people in need at the Bridge Fellowship? You do it. You do it. Don't look at me. I'm not, no, I'm not saying I'm not doing it. I have a responsibility. You have a responsibility. We have this weird mentality about the church that, well, well the, the church should take care of them. You are the church. It's you. Someone could say, well, yeah, but I pay my tithe. That's faith. That's faith. Let me make this really clear again. Tithing is not charity. Tithing is not compassion. Tithing is faith. Tithing, the whole method of tithing that God has set up is for you to trust him with what he's given you. And it tests that trusting on a, you know, weekly, monthly, however often you tithe basis, that as you give your tithe, you are recognizing, Lord, I'm trusting you for the provision of all things. I'm trusting you to walk us through this, to lead me in this. That's tithing. That has nothing to do with generosity or liberality. That is simply faith. I had this conversation with my daughter the other day. She was talking about a, a missions opportunity. Anna Marie was. She was saying, I have, I have an opportunity to to give to this situation, and I'd like to. She said, I'd like to give, I don't know, like $100 a month. And I'm like, you barely make $100 a month, you know, concerned father. <laughs> and she said, well, well but Dad, what, what I was thinking is actually, would it be okay to, to give that out of my tithe? And I sat her down and said, Anna Marie, tithing is not generosity. Tithing is faith. Generosity is what you do on your own. Tithing is what you do to the Lord, unto the Lord. Now, you can disagree with me on, on that, and that's fine. When we sit down with Jesus and he explains how I was right and you were wrong, that's okay. We, you know, not a problem. Sorry, that, I know that sounds arrogant. I'm just kidding. But I really do believe strongly because of what God has taught me that we pay the tithe to trust the Lord. And you know what happens when you start to do that? He starts to free up money for you to be generous, for you to be compassionate for you to care for others, for you to support ministries and Compassion International and, and some of our own Rachel Daly doing her work and other missions projects. You can give more above and beyond and you find that you want to. So this is about compassion here. Generosity and one another care. Yes, let me be clear, the bridge does have budgeting for benevolence that comes out of the tithes and offerings. We have the, the 20% that goes to missions. That comes out of tithes and offerings, 20% of everything that comes in. We intend for missions outside of us, not to bless us, but to bless in the kingdom. And we also have a benevolence fund that we maintain and we keep an eye on so that as needs arise, it's there. We can help, we can. When I say we, I'm not talking about me and the leadership, I'm talking about as a fellowship. Yes, we have a benevolence fund, but that doesn't preclude any one of us from the one another care that comes from the compassion of the body of Christ. We still care for one another. We still look out for one another. And we can see if, if perhaps there's benevolence help from the church, that's fine. You can say, hey, hey I've got a friend. I, I know of a situation. That's fine. But I think what Moses might say is, 
you shall give generously to him. You do it. Second person singular, you do it. Verse 10, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him, because this thing the Lord your God will bless you in in all your work and in all your undertakings. As he's preaching this to the people, it's not you plural. He's talking to all of Israel, but he's saying you singular, you singular care for each other. You take care of your brother, your sister. Listen, let me put it very succinctly here. My generosity is predicated upon God's faithfulness. Write that down. That's really good. My generosity is predicated upon God's faithfulness. That's what Moses is saying in verse 10. Give generously, and the Lord will bless you in all your work and your undertakings. You don't have to worry about where your generosity is coming from or how to cover your generosity. God will cover that. My generosity is predicated upon God's faithfulness, His promise to be faithful to you, to be faithful to me. This is where compassionate generosity becomes pure joy. I know He's got me covered. So I can help a brother or sister. I can give generously and not worry about, well, am I going to be able to make, you know, the next bill pay period? I got you. You trust me in the tithe. You show generosity. I got you covered. I'm the faithful God. He's the one who provides, is he not? Is there anyone here who does not believe that God provides? See, at least among Christians, I don't think anyone would raise their hand on that one. Well, I'm really not sure if God provides for me. I don't think anyone would raise their hand. The question is, yeah, but will he provide enough? Hmm. Will he give what I really need? He knows what you need. Is he a good, good father or not? Do we take him at his word when he says all these things shall be added to you as well? It's a question, again, of, of faith. But my generosity, my compassion, oh, it is fed by the realization of the Shemitah, of my remission of sins. Verse 12. So he says, if your kinsman, a Hebrew man or woman, is sold to you, then he shall serve you six years, but in the seventh year you shall set him free. So this is indentured servitude. When you set him free, you shall not send him away empty-handed. You shall furnish him liberally, from your flock and from your threshing floor and from your wine vat, you shall give to him as the Lord your God has blessed you. Wait a minute. This is a person who came to me in utter debt and I gave him a job. And now I got to provide for him on the way out the door? Exactly. Shemitah, baby. Shemitah. You shall remember, verse 15, that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this today. Skip down to verse 18. It shall not seem hard to you when you set him free. For he's given you six, words, six years worth, double the service of a hired man. So the Lord your God will bless you in whatever you do. It's not hard. It won't be hard for you. You take him on as an indentured service. Man, you send him out and you bless him. You give him from the, from the storehouses so that you give him a good start, a fresh start. Remember, remember this is to eradicate pro poverty by the remission of debt. Send him out with a good start. It shall not be hard for you. The word hard is an interesting word there, yakshay. And it is the same word used to describe Pharaoh's heart in Exodus 13, 15. It shall be, you might say, it shall be it shall not be hard-hearted for you. He's not just saying it, it won't be tough for you to, you know, to give generously when you send the person out. No, it shall not be hard-hearted of you. Your heart should be open and soft to this servant after the six years of service as you send them out. In the same way that God's heart was soft when he released the children of Israel from Egypt and not hard there's a beautiful thing here that the Shemitah, this, this remission that leads to compassion, compassionate generosity, my friends, it will not harden you. It will only soften you to become more generous. That's how it works. It's very cool that our entire motivation 
for releasing each other is the remission and compassion of Christ in us. Remember, you were once a slave. Remember, you were once a slave before Jesus. Not anymore. Not anymore. And if you've been set free, will you not then turn around and free others of the debt they owe? Financial, emotional. Someone owe you something emotionally? Someone owe you that apology that you've never gotten? Oh, I'll talk to them as soon as they fess up for what they did. How about Shemitah? Full remission of debt. How about letting drop whatever has been done against you by another person? It'll soften your heart. And it may just free them up to find salvation themselves. Matthew 6, 12, Jesus taught us to pray, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Ephesians 4, 32. Ephesians 4, 32 is a verse that everyone should have memorized. Just make a note of this. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. And now we can move into the real heart of the sermon after the introduction's done. Verse 16. (laughs) It shall come about if he says to you, I will not go out from you because he loves you and your household since he fares well with you. Then you shall take an awl and pierce it through his ear into the door and he shall be your servant forever. Also you shall do likewise to your maidservant. (laughs) He who has an ear. Let him hear. I mean, talk about giving your all. That's what he's <laughs> saying here. Seriously, this is, this is the good stuff. This is the good stuff. This is where remission that yields compassion takes us a step further into number three, devotion. Devotion. You, you can... You can measure the change of a heart from verse 1 all the way to verse 16 here. How a person comes out of their own debt and begins to compassionately care for others in debt. And next thing you know, this person is absolutely devoted, a servant, a devoted servant. In the Hebrew, the word servant here is abdi or abed. It's the same word used in different ways, abdi. And it literally translates bond slave. It is the lowest form of servant in the Hebrew language, bond slave. The Greek equivalent word, many of you have heard, doulos. Not diakonos. Diakonos also means servant. But diakonos, where we get deacon, is like minister, someone who serves in position. But doulos is the lowest form of a bond slave. And that's the word we see throughout the New Testament. Paul, a doulos, a bond servant of Christ Jesus, Romans 1.1. Simon Peter, 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, a bondservant and apostle of Christ Jesus. James chapter 1, verse 1, Jacob, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jude chapter 1, verse 1, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of Jacob. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his bond servants, his doulos, or there it will be the douloi, the things which must soon take place, and he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 5, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Christ's sake. You know, if you think about this, it sounds kind of like you've just jumped from one, you finally get freedom from slavery, and now you're jumping right back into slavery. You're free. You're remitted. Go. Be blessed. Start your life. You can do whatever you want now. It's it's total freedom, and you're going to dive right back into slavery? And people have an issue with Christianity because of that. Why would I want to serve in heaven if I could be a king in hell? (laughs) Ain't no kings in hell. People who don't, I don't want to serve. I don't want to be part of that whole service mentality. Listen to this. Romans chapter 6, verse 16, Paul says, Do you not know that when you present yourselves to uh, someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? That's pretty obvious, right? Either of sin resulting in death, 
or of righteousness resulting, or, or yeah, righteous, obedience resulting in righteousness. Sin resulting in death, obedience resulting in righteousness. You're a slave either way. You're going to be a slave. Do you realize that? You're going to be a slave either way. You're either going to be a slave of sin or you're going to be a slave of righteousness. And there is no middle ground. No one's riding the fence on into eternity. Slaves of sin, slaves of righteousness. I don't like the sound of that. Give it a moment. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. And Paul says, I'm I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. You didn't have to do good stuff. When you were a slave of sin, that's all you had to do, serve sin. Didn't have to be good. Didn't have to go to church. Didn't have to read your Bible. Didn't have to do any of that church stuff because I'm a slave of sin. And that's all you had to be concerned with. He says, therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which now you are ashamed? The outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit. And here it is, sanctification. And the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm a new slave. I was a slave of sin. I'm a slave to righteousness. By choice. By choice. This is key. I chose to stay in my master's house. I love my master. I don't want to go out from his house. I want to be connected. I chose to be a slave to righteousness rather than to sin. Someone would say, well, I ain't choosing to be no slave. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. The question isn't whether or not you're going to be a a slave, a bondservant. The question is, who or what are you going to serve? Look at this. How is the ear piercing done? If you look back at Exodus 21, verse 6, the first time we hear about this ear piercing with an awl, it says, his master shall bring him to God, he shall bring him to the door or the door post, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl. Now, if you just read Exodus 21, 6, you could think, okay, well, they want the ceremony to take place in the front porch. You know, I'm not sure why they mentioned the door post, but bring him to the door before God and, and pierce his ear there. Well, then we come to Deuteronomy 15, 17, and it's very, very specific You shall take an awl and pierce it through his ear into the door. That's weird. So many things in the Bible are just weird. But now we start to understand what is the picture God is painting here. The slave's ear was pierced right into the door or the doorpost. First off, his blood's now getting on the door. His blood's on the doorpost. Wait a minute. Whose blood was first splashed on the doorpost? Passover lamb. Blood of the lamb was on the doorpost. Just as Jesus became bondservant first. He's not asking you to do anything you didn't already do. He's the first bondservant. Blood on the door. Isaiah 42 verse 1. God says, behold my servant, my bond slave, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. You know why Jesus has all that tenderness? Because he's experienced it himself. No, I could say because he's God, and God is inherently compassionate. But our inherently compassionate God also experienced the pain of this world. And so he will not break a bruised reed. He will not put out a dimly burning wick. He will faithfully bring forth justice. Philippians 2, 6, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant. 
Well, when was Jesus' ear ever pierced? Oh, listen to this. Psalm 40, verse 6. Prophetically, David writes, Sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. My ears you have opened. The word opened, karita, in the Hebrew is dug or pierced. Well, that's David writing, right? He's writing by the Spirit. He's writing prophetically. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. Now, who's that? See, that's Jesus. And it's Jesus. It's the Spirit of Christ through David saying, my ears you have dug. My, my ears you have pierced. Now, now, stay with me on this. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 7, which is the parallel verse to Psalm 40. Psalm 40, verse 7. Hebrews 10, verse 7 direct quote. But in Hebrews 10 verse 5, it's quoted as a prophecy of Messiah because this is Messiah talking. My ear you have pierced. My ear you have dug. My ear you have opened. The Hebrew writer, Hebrew pastor says in Hebrews 10 5, therefore when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. Well, in the Hebrew scriptures it says, but my ears you have opened. In the New Testament, a body you've prepared. He's just, is he just changing the words to try and make his point? No, 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 no. Both translations are acceptable. Both translations are actually accurate because saying an ear you have opened is a Hebrew euphemism for saying you have created me. You opened my ears in the act of creation in the same way you prepared a body, it's, it's one and the same idea. Ear dug, body prepared, both speak of God's creative work, digging out, piercing the ears, preparing a body for himself as the one who did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So do you see that his blood on the doorpost, as in the Passover lamb, the fact that his ear was pierced, the body prepared, that speaks of Jesus, the first servant pierced. And you know the piercing of the servant Jesus cuts much deeper. They pierced my hands and feet, Psalm twenty-two sixteen. 16. He was pierced through for our transgressions, Isaiah 53, verse 5. They will look on me whom they have pierced, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Take him to the door and pierce his ear right into the door. By the way, so the family of the slave is standing around. That's part of the reason the slave wanted to stay. I don't want to go out for my wife and my children who are now part of the, of the indentured servitude of the household. I don't want my freedom without them. I want to stay right here. I love my master. I love my wife. I love my children. I just want to be part of this. So they all come out to the, to the porch and they take out that awl and the ear put, uh, servant puts his ear up against the doorpost. Master drives the awl through it. What would that say to wifey and the kids? What would that tell them? Dad loves us so much, he would rather be a servant of the house than have his freedom somewhere else. You think that they knew that dad loved them? Do you think his wife understood that she was important to him? Bible says in Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love toward us and yet, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, was pierced, came to the door and was driven through. And remember that that, that piercing symbol that, that stands proving that the servant would remain a servant permanently, John 20, 27, Jesus said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands. Look at my piercings. Put your hand into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. John says, Revelation 5, 6, I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain. The scars are there. The symbol of his servitude remains. Luke 12, 37, blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you, he'll gird himself and have them recline and will come up and wait on them. Why? Because that's what the servant does. That is so the heart of God. Do you think it'll be hard for Jesus to serve you at the table that day? He'll be having a ball. That's his nature. This is what we need to get into our own hearts. The very nature of God is to serve. 
So when he calls you and me to be bond slaves, he's calling us to himself. Because that's who he is. That's what he does. Jesus Christ, God with us, opens the door to the high office of bond slave. By example, by his life, which is why to be devoted to Jesus is to relish that title above all others. To be called a bond slave of Jesus, that is what the Christian aspires to. It's not elders, not pastor, not prophet or priest or king. Bond slave. Make me a servant like you. Speaking of the door, last thought. Why was the piercing done there? I mean, into the door. Because it joined the servant to the master's house for life. That was the picture. I am now a servant of this house. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 4 says, Every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm and to the end. This is amazing to me. Brothers and sisters, we are not forced into indentured servitude. We are loved into the household of God. So as bond slaves, we know, I'll take the position of servant in the house any day because I'm part of the house. I'm connected to the house. The most devoted follower of Jesus relishes the position of bond servant Because all the prodigal wants to do when he comes home is just serve. Just give me a job, Dad. Just let me serve in your house. That's all I need. That's all I request. But before we're even done requesting that service, the father is already calling out, quickly, bring out the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf, kill it, and let us celebrate. For this son of mine was dead And has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Luke 15. Paul says in Galatians 4, 7. Because you are sons. Men. Women. I don't like it when I hear my sister say I can't relate to that sonship. Hey you better. I can't relate to the brideship either. But that's what I got to be. It's positional. Men and women equally positioned as firstborn, as inheritors, as sons. And Paul says, because you are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, an heir through God. Romans 8, 15, you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. We are children of God. I'll serve in your house, Lord. Sit down and, and, and eat, son. No, I, I just want a position of, uh, of bonds. Just give me a, a room in the lower part of the house, uh, Father. Hey, your room's prepared. I have a place prepared for you. Sons, daughters, children, by remission of debt, which brings compassion into our lives and causes us to be devoted to the Father, devoted as a pierced bond slave to the Lord. And listen to this. Verse 16 again, it shall come about if he says to you, I will not go out from you. These are the words. Elah devarim of the slave set free. The slave set free says, I will not go out from you. Revelation 22 verse 3 says, there will no longer be any curse and the throne of God and of the lamb will be in it and his bond servants will serve him and they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Oh Lord, pierce my ear at the door of your house that I may never go out from you again. That we all, Lord Jesus, would be consigned to you by our very hearts, loved into your household by the sacrifice of the ultimate bondservant, Jesus. May we emulate him in how we treat one another and how we live our lives. May we express the very love you've given us. Lord, we don't want to do any of these things for show 
We don't want to be seen as the super servant of the church, impressive with all kinds of medals and ribbons. Father, we just want to serve you because we love you so much. And we love you so much because, Father, nobody has loved us like you have. Oh, Lord Jesus, pierce our ears. Draw us near. And may we never go out from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you would have that kind of devotion, I invite you to come to Jesus this morning. And if there's something you've been holding on to, maybe a debt you're having trouble releasing, someone owes you relationally, emotionally, personally, how about we start praying right now for full remittance? No more holding on to that stuff, that they might be free of the debt. It'll change your heart. In the meantime, come to Jesus. Just come to Jesus. Let's stand and sing. Thoughts define me, you're inside me, you're my reality. define me you're inside me you're my reality you're so real to me
faces the collision on the way back home with the arms of a father who won't let go as you came running down my prodigal road you came running with a ring and a rope grace is the collision on the way back home with the arms of a father who won't let go yes you came you came running down my prodigal Abba, we belong to you. We will not go out from you again. Confirm, strengthen, and establish, Lord, our faith and our compassion by the remission of sin, and Lord, till we become fully devoted, overwhelmingly, completely devoted to you. Oh, Lord, continue to sanctify us in mind, in body, and spirit. Father, I want to lift up this morning. We have a number of people who are sick from, from this COVID disease. I lift up the Shaleski family to you and pray that there will be healing in the household. I lift up Kurt and Kim Cole, Father, and ask that they would be healed from this thing. Father, I, I lift up Brad Vale to you. 
And Lord, we know that now uh, surely is in your tender hands. But for Brad suffering COVID himself and the loss of his life, his wife at the same time, Lord, it's a dreadful thing and, and our hearts break for him, but we pray that you will give him strength and faith, knowing he's going to see surely, surely again and soon. And Father, I pray for protection over our body, uh, physically, Lord, but also the gathering of the saints. Would you protect us from this thing and give us wisdom, Lord? We want to hear from you whether and when we should wear a mask, whether or not we should have a vaccine. Father, I pray that this would be removed as a political issue and become a personal faith issue that we would trust and listen to you. And Lord, that you also in this place would cause us to love and respect one another, to know my brothers and sisters are listening to. And maybe what God's asking me to do is not what he's asking them to do. I just pray, Father, your grace would be in and over this place. And then as we gather, we would do so in the joy and affection of the Holy Spirit without fear. And Father, we would also do it with wisdom and compassionate grace one for another. And we thank you for your message to us. It just reminds us why we're here and what this is really all about. And so I pray that you will, Lord, pierce our ears to the doorpost of the household of God to never depart so long as we shall live, which we know is right on through eternity. And I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. So glad you're here. Remember, if you're feeling sick or whatever, we're live streaming. You can stay home. <laughs> but otherwise, please be here. We love seeing you. God bless. See you on the other side of September. <laughs>